we the topic for today is the ethics of progress and so this whole uh, day this whole conference is about uh, free market env environmentalism and uh, climate policy and this stuff are all really technical uh, issues but we also thought it's not just about techniques but also about uh, ethics and uh, morality and we realized that, I mean, personally, at least, I realized that my generation was becoming more and more pessimistic about the technology, innovation, and progress. And people tend to think more and more that it's bring, it brings more troubles than actually that, that it solves. And so that's why we asked you to deliver a speech on uh, the, the ethics of progress and how we could uh, defend innovation on moral grounds. So now with the floor is yours. Sure, thank you for inviting me. I apologize for not, after studying French for years, not knowing any French. So uh, this is all gonna be English. Um, I think one of, the, um, one of the most depressing things in the world right now, even more depressing than COVID, is the fact that your genera generation is so depressed. You live in amazing times. You live in times of, you know, of, of incredible success for the human species. We live longer, we live healthier, we live in a sense easier lives than we've ever lived before. We have access to values and to both material and spiritual that our ancestors could not have even imagined would exist, never mind be as prevalent as they are today. You know, uh, from your phone, you have access to every piece of music ever written in human history at a marginal cost of zero. You have access to all the great literature. You have access to movies, to every work of art, almost ever, ever produced in its two dimensions or in, I'm not sure what dimension music is in, three dimensions, I guess. Um, you have access to instantaneously at a marginal cost of zero. Life is amazing. We drink the cleanest water we've ever drunk as a human species. We can, you can open a tap in almost any country, anywhere today and, and drink its water without thinking twice. We breathe some of the cleanest air we've ever breathed, particularly in the West. We don't have to deal with the stink of horse manure. We don't have to deal with the, you know, stink of agriculture, of the stink of fires, of the stink of living in huts and in, in uh, primitive, primitive type of, uh, of lodging. We live in beautiful apartments, homes. Life is amazing. And it, it seems there's an entire generation growing up believing somehow that their lives are horrible, that progress is bad for them, that we need to slow down, we need to stop, we need to value, we need to change our values completely. And, and I think this is unbelievably tragic. Um, and it is if there is a cause for uh, slowing down a progress, if there is a cause for slowing down in, in um, technology, it is this attitude. This attitude will bring about a stoppage in progress, a stopping in technology and stopping in the betterment of human life. So why are people so depressed? Why are people so afraid? Because you see everywhere Fear, fear that the climate is going to kill us all, fear that the air we breathe is getting worse, not better, fear that somehow technology is going to dominate us. I mean, uh, just, just a couple of years ago, I remember every second story was about AI, artificial intelligence, was going to take over our lives and kill us all or replace us or do something horrific to us, that the future was bleak. I mean, it's almost like human beings have this need to believe the world is going to come to an end, right? We have in religion what are called millennial cults, cults that every 
few decades rise up and say, okay, it's the end of the world now. That, you know, this decade, the end is going to, the world is going to end. Jesus is coming back and we're all going to have, uh, you know, whatever happens when Jesus comes back. I, I'm not up to my scriptures. But this idea of end of world, this idea of disaster, this idea of we're killing ourselves is somehow something that serves some psychological need that human beings have. But it is counter to the facts, counter to reality. Again, life has never been better on planet Earth, and there's no reason to believe if we do the right things, the life will not be better 100 years from now. Life won't be even better 1,000 years from now, human life. Progress is movement towards greater values, movement towards greater life, movement towards better, greater when it comes to human life. Progress is the recognition that human life is the standard of value. To evaluate something as good or evil, one has to have a standard. By what standard? We are human. Each one of us is his own standard. My life is my standard. Rand, Ayn Rand teaches us the morality is not about sacrificing, dying, helping the humanity. Morality is about living the best life you can live for yourself. It's about achieving your own happiness. It's about discovering the values that are necessary to live a good life, a successful life as a human being. It means using your mind to choose the values that are going to lead you towards success as a human being. Spiritual, material values, the values necessary for you to thrive. So morality is about the individual. But if morality is about each individual pursuing his life, making his life the best that it can be, if morality is about each individual pursuing their happiness, then progress in a, in a social context is individuals making their lives better. What is progress after all, if not making my life better? And when we think about ethics in society, then what is, what is it if, we, if all individuals are pursuing their life, pursuing their values, trying to make their life better, as a group, what are they doing? Well, they're um, enhancing human life. They're bettering human life. And from a societal perspective, what we need is to create a political system that enables people to pursue their happiness, that enables people as individuals to pursue the values necessary for them to live a good, successful life. So that which makes it possible for individuals to pursue a good life is the good. That which damages it, that which holds it back, that which suppresses the ability of individuals to pursue their values, to pursue their happiness, is evil. Progress is the manifestation of individuals pursuing their values. It's a manifestation of people wanting their life to get better. It's not a decision we make. Our responsibility as a, as a you know, group, as a, if we will, is to facilitate individual freedom. It's to facilitate the ability of individuals to live. And the result of leaving individuals to live, we've seen this time and time again all over the world, everywhere, is progress. Progress is the outcome. The outcome of leaving individuals free. The outcome of individuals trying to make their lives as individuals better. The outcome of not trying to dictate to individuals what values they should pursue and how they should live. Freedom will always result in progress because human beings 
cannot stand for stagnation. Stagnation, when do we stagnate? When is the time we're most stagnant? Well, when we're dead. Life requires an active process. Life requires constant engagement. Life requires the pursuit of values, the constant pursuit of values. So to be anti-progress is to be anti-human life. To be anti-progress is to be anti-human freedom. To be anti-progress is to be on the side of death and destruction, which aren't necessarily immoral. Life is the standard of morality. Human life is the standard of morality. Individual human life is the standard of morality. And to advocate against progress is to advocate against individual human life. It's to advocate indivi against individual human progress. Now, many environmentalists would argue that human beings are destroying the planet. We're creating havoc you know, in the environment. But what does that mean? Are we destroying the planet? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Everything that we have as human beings has come from us reshaping our environment, reshaping our planet. Human beings are not neutral when it comes to survival. We don't just accept the environment as it is and figure out how to live within it. What do we do? We chop down trees and build huts. We take away grasslands and forests and plant agriculture. We demolish hills to use the, 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 you know, the gravel, the rock, to make cement, to build skyscrapers. We pave roads from point A to point B when we need to get somewhere. Human beings change the environment. It's how we survive. It's how we progress. It's how we live. If we stop changing our environment, we die as a species. We cannot compete at the material level. There are 8 billion people in the world today. The only reason 8 billion people can stay alive is because they're constantly reshaping nature around them. They're constantly remaking the planet. And they're constantly, as we do this, improving human life. 30 years ago, about 30% of the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, 8% of the world lives in extreme poverty. Hopefully, within 20 years, 0% of the world will live in extreme poverty. The only way to do that is to change our environment. The only way to do that is to reshape the planet. Why do we care about the planet? Why do we care about the environment? Well, I care only in the sense that it affects human life. The standard is still the same. The standard is human life. If changing our environment is good for human life, then great. If changing the environment is bad for human life, we need to solve the problem. But the burden needs to be to prove that changing stuff hurts human life. Because so far, we've been changing the planet for the last, I don't know, how long have human beings been around? But suddenly, since the agricultural revolution and even before that, for 10,000 years, and life keeps getting better. Human life keeps getting better. We keep living longer, longer, healthier, and cooler. I mean, look at this. I'm giving a lecture in France, but 
well, unfortunately, I can't actually be in France using a technology that just 10 years ago didn't really exist, a company that most people around the world never heard of until recently called Zoom, in spite of authoritarian governments shutting us down at home, we are still communicating, we are still running conferences, we're still engaging in exchange. Why? Because we've changed nature, turned it into fiber optics, put cables under the ocean, put satellites into space so that we can communicate in spite of being thousands of miles away. So the standard for environmentalism, the standard for what is good or bad is human life, not the state of the planet, not some people's fears, but what is objectively good or bad for human life? It's clearly, if you're engaged in an activity that is hurting other people, that is literally destroying life, and, you, and people can prove that, then it is the role of government to stop you from engaging in those activities. But we don't need, you know, big government, we don't need large institutions, whole agencies to tell us that. Uh, that's been around in common law for hundreds of years. So human beings survive by changing their environment. Environmental change is necessary for human survival and for human thriving. Progress is necessary for human survival and human thriving. When we stop progressing in history, we decline. In life generally, not just when you talk about economic or social progress, in life generally, you're either, movement, you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. Standing still is not an option. Living beings move, they act. It's either towards life or towards death. Progress is life, that's why it's moral. Progress is what individuals do when they're left free. That's why it's moral. Progress is pro-success, pro-happiness, pro-human values. That's why it's moral. And anybody trying to stop us is advocating for death and destruction, advocating for poverty. We've seen this. We've seen civilizations where progress has stopped. When that happens, people don't just stay at where they are. Things get worse and things can get worse fast. So environmentalists who are claiming that progress is bad don't understand what it takes to keep human beings alive, to keep human beings, to, to allow human beings to achieve happiness and success. Environmentalists who advocate for the environment, they think the environment has some value beyond its value to us as human beings. But when talking about value, Ayn Rand always asks a very fundamental, important question. Value to whom and for what? To be a value, it has to be a value for something. There is no values external to human beings. Unless you believe in aliens and God, then maybe there's a value to God and values to the aliens. But the only thing we know out there that exists is life on planet Earth. You have to have a living thing that values something. Otherwise, it's not a value. It's a value to somebody and for a particular purpose. And the end of that purpose, the purpose is your life, your successful life. So the environment is a value to me because I breathe the air, I drink the water, I live within it. But it's also a value to me because it has the resources I need to consume. 
It has the rare earth metals that make my iPhone possible. It provides me with the trees that I need to chop down to build my house. It provides me with all the resources I need to make my life better. So the environment is a value because I can exploit it. It's a value to me to the extent that I exploit it. The idea of stopping the exploitation of the environment is the idea of giving up on human life. So to fight this, I think there are two important points. Morally, we have to understand that the standard of morality is human life. And human life requires achievement. It requires challenges. It requires values. And therefore, human life requires progress. The number of human beings on planet Earth is probably going to grow, at least for a while. That requires growth. It necessitates growth. If we care about poverty, that necessitates growth. If we care about any individual being able to make the most of their life, then we value growth and progress. So point one is human life requires progress and human life is the standard of value. Therefore, progress is more. And second, the consequence of progress are wonderful for human life. I mean, it's inspiring to see the technology. It's inspiring to see the architecture. It's inspiring to see the technology that, that the modern world is comprised of. It's inspiring to be able to be in my home in Puerto Rico and deliver these remarks to you wherever you may be. Some of you in France, there might even be some people on YouTube from all over the world. That's progress. Life is pretty amazing. Your life is pretty amazing if you take it seriously, if you choose to make the most of it. Don't let the, uh, the fear mongers depress you into not wanting, not striving, not pushing yourself to live to the max. So live. Progress is about life. If we value life, we must value progress. Thank you. F thank you very much, Aaron, for uh, this inspiring speech. We... We have some questions, but I'm, I'm going to start uh, maybe one to, for the beginning, just one uh, very basic question about the def maybe definition of this, because we you talked a lot about progress, but what is the relationship of progress with technology and innovation? Is innovation and technology always a progress or is it the same thing? Or can you have like a technology, technology which is actually not a progress in the ethical sense? And because you also say that the standard of morality is human life. In other words, can we have uh, progress in like technological feeds, fields, but which constitute a threat to human life? I mean, to the extent that a technological advance is a threat to human life, over time, people will stop using it. Over time, people will abandon it. So to the extent that we value human life, sure. I mean, if you think about nuclear energy, nuclear energy is uh, potentially immense progress and can create immense progress, but it can also blow the world up and, and destroy all the human beings. To the extent that it is, has the capacity for destruction, this technology, it is so far being limited in its use. We are not a suicidal species. If you address people rationally and say, look, technology X is suicidal, it will kill you, then people will stop using it. But all evidence suggests that the overwhelming, the overwhelming um, 
technological progress that we have seen in the world over the last 250 years has been pro-human life, has been enhanced human life, and not regressed it. And the one technology that we are, that has the potential to destroy human life, which is nuclear power, we have at least so far managed to not use it in ways that are destructive. We haven't used it in ways that are to its fullest potential in terms of progress either because of fear. Again, I mean, uh, 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 Germany and much of Europe is denuclearizing, which is an, an insane, which is insanity, right? The United States hasn't built a nuclear power plant since the 1970s. Um, that is insanity, but that is driven by statism, not by the choices of individuals. So the fear here is that if there is going to be a technology that is destructive to human being, it will be brought about by status, not by the marketplace. And I know the obvious next question is, I don't know, I'll let you ask it. <laughs> I, I don't know if, it's, if that's the obvious next, next question, but my next question was, uh, but the, the thing is technology now is getting so complex, so much complex than it was in the past, that do you think that we can completely control it? Is it possible that we actually lose control over technology and innovation? No, not if we're smart about it. And, and there's no reason to think we're going to lose control over technology and innovation. I mean, I know we all grew up with, I mean, you guys, maybe this is even before your time, with the Terminator movies, right? And where, where uh, yeah. the technology wakes up and destroy, decides it doesn't need us as human beings. Um, even if that were possible, and I'm dubious, we're, hundred, we're, we're decades and decades and decades away from that kind of innovation. I mean, AI is really, really good at fairly simple tasks. We're still far away from the kind of conceptual thinking that human beings are capable of. We're far, far, far away from even the, the, the think about how we move, just how I'm moving my hand. No robot can do that. It can do that, but it, it can't move. It can barely stand. If you've seen robots walk, they can barely manage walking. They can't get in and out of a car, not yet, right? So we're way, 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 way uh, uh, far away from this idea that the technology is going to become so amazing that somehow it's going to decide they don't need us. Now, remember, technology needs to be able to decide. Uh, decision requires consciousness, a particular form of consciousness, which we as human beings have that is capable of free will. There is no indication that a computer is capable of consciousness. And there's no indication, and there's certainly no indication that we're anywhere near, anywhere near, getting close to the ability to create such a computer. And by the time we get to that point, I mean, now I'm speculating, right? Now we're talking about science, science fiction. Um, at some point, things will change. That is, at some point, will you be able to separate the technology from human beings? I mean, when we get to the point where computers are that sophisticated, will we not also be bioengineering ourselves? Will we not also be making ourselves, in a sense, smarter? We will not then, at that point, integrating the technology, the external technology, chip technology with our own bodies and our own minds. Who knows what the future has in store for us? I'm excited about it. And to me, it's bizarre to be scared of it, to be afraid of it. We as human beings control it, control the path that we're going to head towards it. We are going to determine our future. What scares me is not technology. What scares me is authoritarians, statism, communism, fascism. That's what scares me. But if you leave individuals free to live and free to develop technology, I mean, good stuff happens. Every example in history is good stuff happens. And believe me, Every generation, like your generation, has been afraid of the future. But stop it. Learn from the past. Learn from what you see in front of you. Technology is life enhancing. So, no, I, I don't see technology turning against human beings 
and uh, and and destroying us. Uh, it just it just makes no sense. If you want a more optimistic view of the future, think uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation series. Uh, you know, which is, I think, a much healthier view of the future. But look, we're hundreds of years probably away from any of that. So stop worrying. Be happy. Okay. But maybe uh, apart from uh, AI and uh, robots taking over the world, there's also the problem that there are so, some technologies which are so complex that we don't know we don't know all the implications and they can have some side effects. And the question is, so do we decide to use them, to take the risk to reuse them, why we don't know what may be all the, all the implications, even well, though it might bring some good, give but also many bad side effects. Give me an example. Uh, well, I, I was thinking about GMOs, uh, for, example, the, the, for example, in China that we used on, uh, on newborn babies. Uh, I think uh, one scientist in China who uh, transformed um, the... Yeah, he did genetic engineering on, feed, on, on, uh, on uh, you know, on basically on fetuses. So, so they, they... Yeah, they, exactly. Genetic engineering. We which, well, he was targeting, I think, uh, one specific gene, but the thing he realized now, we don't know what will be the all implications and maybe- The we... only way to know is to figure it out. The idea that we can come up with certainty about complex phenomena in advance without experimenting is bizarre, right? So the precautionary principle is a death knell, this idea that until we know it's 100% safe, but you never know something's 100 safe. I mean, you wouldn't leave your home if you were on that premise. Do I know with certainty I won't get run over today on the, in the, you know, I won't get into an accident with my car that'll kill me? No, I don't know with certainty because I don't know what the other drivers are going to do. I can't control what the other drivers are going to do on the road. I, and I live in Puerto Rico. Believe me, I can't control what the other drivers on the road are going to do. That was a joke that didn't work. Um, so life is about life entails uncertainty. And it entails trying to assess with the best available knowledge that we have, what, what are the risks involved? But just to, to, but there's no, um, there's no point. And there's no conceptual validity to the idea of anything new. Oh, there might be dangers. I don't know what the dangers are. I can't predict what the dangers are. I have no evidence that there's any danger, but there might be dangers. Now, look, bioengineering is really, really tricky. And it's not that we as a species, it's dangerous. If you screw up engineering a child's gene and let's say, you cause them to be deformed or you cause them great pain. That is a tragedy. So you better get it right. And to think that scientists and doctors don't care. Of course they care. They want to get it right. And, and the Chinese scientist got it right. There's no evidence that anything bad happened, but he's gone to jail. We'll never see him again. Right? China has made him disappear. But what exactly did he do wrong? He, he was a little ahead of his time. So was Galileo. So was anybody who advanced human knowledge. Nothing, there were no bad consequences. The, the, as far as I know, the babies born were, were fine. Um, you, cannot, you cannot live under the fear of something you have no evidence for. So, I mean, imagine a world in which we can bioengineer diseases away. If you have an inclination to Alzheimer's disease, dementia, we can, we can change that gene so you never have to suffer from dementia. Imagine if we can bioengineer so you don't have cancer. I mean, wow, that is fantastic. That is so amazing. And if we can today bioengineer food to have more vitamins and to, to be more nutritious, Fantastic. And there is zero, literally zero evidence that GMO in food is harmful to anybody. So we use arbitrary statements, arbitrary assertions about the danger of things 
in order to stop progress, that is anti-life. All right. So if I understand well, you mean that uh, for the question of how we handle risk, we should just uh, rely on the res uh, injured individual responsibility principle and not uh, state um, or collective uh, regulations. Well, I mean, you could have collective regulations in the sense of if you're doing something that is clearly risky, but for, for the state to get involved, there has to be significant evidence of harm. But as long as there's no significant evidence of harm, the state has no role. It's individual responsibility, market's responsibility. You as a market participant should not buy a product you know is harmful to other people. It's the same as COVID right now, right? It's your individual responsibility to figure out how to stay healthy. The government cannot, has no right to lock you up, to tell you you can't live, leave your home because you might, there's no evidence, you might be risky to other people. Now, if you test positive, then the state has proof that you're dangerous, right? Because you could infect other people. It can tell you to stay home. But as long as you have not tested positive, the state has no role. The state can only act when it has positive, substantial evidence that you are dangerous, that you are going to do harm to other people. That makes sense? Right. Yep. Thank Robin you. Robin has a question on the chat here. Should I quickly answer this? Yes, of course. Uh, Gary is not hostile AI, but AI in hostile human hands. That's absolutely true. And you can see that in China right now. That's scary. So it's not the technology that's scary. It's the hostile human hands that are scary. So again, put the responsibility where it belongs. The responsibility, for example, for the use of AI for bad uses in China is on the Chinese government. That's who is responsible. It's not the AI in and of itself. Absolutely. Now, I am not that scared of it long term for this reason. I believe that authoritarianism destroys innovation. Authoritarianism makes progress, technological progress, ultimately impossible. And as China returns to being more and more and more authoritarianism, technological advance will shrink and their ability to use technology well will go away. So I don't believe in 1984 not because I don't think there are bad people who would want it, but because I think Orwell's depiction of the state is of a state that's too efficacious, too successful. Government is not that good at what it does, and it cannot coerce scientists to create the kind of technologies that can be that helpful. There's a reason uh, Soviet and Nazi weapons were not as sophisticated and not as good as weapons made by free countries. Under freedom, people innovate and people create and people make stuff in ways that you cannot have under authoritarianism. So I'm not that afraid of authoritarian governments as a threat to me. I'm afraid of my own authoritarian government. That scares the Jesus out of me. But not because of the use of technology, but because of the ability to use force against me. So yes, I agree with you, Robert. That is the fear. But again, let's focus on what the enemy, who the enemy is. The enemy is not progress. The enemy is authoritarian governments. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I will move to another question from the public. Uh, what <laughs> what is the field where we could be much further in term when we could go much further in terms of progress? And why would be, do you have example of policy that should be banned today to allow more progress? So uh, do I have examples of what should be banned? Uh, example of, policy, uh, of policies that should be banned today or policies or regulations uh, that should be banned today to allow more progress. Yeah, I mean, almost all the regulations. I mean, all right. All the regulations that are on the books today in the European Union, in the United States of America, uh, are holding back progress. It's not an accident that the only progress, real progress we see today is in technology, is in the field of technology. Because technology is not very regulated. There's almost no regulation on technology. But we don't see a lot of progress in automobiles. 
because it's been heavily, heavily regulated. We don't see a lot of progress in air flight, airplanes, because they've been very, very regulated. We're seeing some progress in space travel because people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are pushing the envelope against regulations. We're seeing it in automobiles a little bit because Elon Musk is pushing the envelope against regulation there. But even there, he's cheating because he's getting government money, a lot of it, uh, in order to do it. Um, it's very difficult to innovate in regulated industries. And therefore, the only way to progress, the only way to innovate, the only way to move forward as a species, as, a, as human beings, is to get government out of the way, across the board. Um, you know, just any name, pretty much any regulation right now uh, that, that, that the European Union has on industry, on, uh, you know, with the exception of the only regulations that government should have these days, and th these are really laws that protect individuals, that, you know, if there's something that, that, that is, is uh, emitted into the air that clearly harms people, then you shouldn't do it. That, that's just, just, you know, that just uh, was protected under common law, right? Um, don't poison the water. Don't poison the air. Other than that, you know, what regulations do we need? So I would abolish almost all of them. Okay. Thanks, uh, but or but uh, you also say that uh, the role uh, of of the of the government was to stop activities that do destroy the environment, as you just actually uh, just uh, no, said. No, I, I don't. The whole concept of the environment is a, is a bad concept. I wish you. I wish I, there's no such thing as free market environmentalism because environmentalism is not a legitimate concept. Environmentalism is the idea that the environment independent of human beings is what's important. The environment is not important. What's important is human life. So clean air is important to human life, so we're pro-clean air. Clean water is important for human life, so we're pro-clean water. There are other things out there that might be important to human life, but the standard is human life, not the environment. The environment does not exist. You, you, you have to ask whose environment. And I would argue that the environment for human being, right. the environment for human life, is the best it's ever been in all of human history. Yeah, I get your point. The idea that it's always a relationship between yeah. us and the environment. Uh, but again, what I wanted to say is... There is no such thing as the environment. But yes, us and nature. I think mean, that's, that's, that's a concept. That's a notion. It's, it's not really precise, but we still, it's still really helpful like, to talk about what's around us. And also because this is where, basically where we live and it does have an impact as on our you, own lives. Our environment, right? So it's not the environment as a thing out there. It's our environment. It's something that is ours. So nature is out there. Nature is a thing. Environment is not a thing. Environment is somebody's environment, my environment. What's my environment like? What's your environment like? What's the environment for human beings? But it, it, words matter. And the environmentalists are very good at creating this notion that there's something out there that we need to protect that's independent of human beings. No, there isn't. <laughs> it's, again, oh, so, but, but I'm sorry, I, I stopped your question in the middle. Yeah, but that's quite linked. Oh, well, I think you can use another word for environment. But just what I mean, just, I mean, uh, how do you protect uh, the place where you live? Because, you know, if the, 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 pre the place around you becomes uh, dirty, it's also a uh, danger uh, for, your, for your health. So that's yeah. what it's all about when we talk about free market envir environmentalism, even though might might I not be the wish best word. They didn't use the word environmentalism. I know. I, I have a lot of friends who are free market environmentalists. And, but I, I wish they'd use a different word. Um, how do we protect it from getting dirty? Well, we know how to protect it from getting dirty. It's very simple. It's called private property. The more private property we have, the cleaner the world becomes. If I own the river, you don't throw your garbage in my river, just like you can't throw your garbage in my backyard. If we found a way to privatize the oceans, the oceans would be cleaner. If we found a way to privatize the oceans, we wouldn't run out of fish, just like we don't run out of cows. We have more cows than we used to have. Why? Because we eat them. The more cows we eat, the more cows there are. The same, by the way, with trees. 
if you privatized all the forest, if you privatized the Amazon, you would probably have more forest, not less forest. Because there's value in having a forest, whether it's to chop down the trees and replant so that you can use the wood, or whether you want to preserve the forest. But the way, best way to preserve the forest is to own it. Because if you own the forest, you can do whatever the hell you want with it, including preserve it. So this solution to cleanliness of private property, and the idea is you can't dirty my property. So you can't destroy my water, and you can't destroy my air. And if we understand, if we have a concept around a proper definition of private property and how it applies to water, how it applies to air, how it applies to the oceans, how it applies to all these things, then all of these so-called environmental problems go away. Yeah, but that's a problem because I agree, I completely agree with you in theory, but it's way more, it's way harder to privatize the ocean or even it the is. atmosphere than to privatize just the forest. It so is. how do we actually do, do it? Right? That's, that's what we should be focused on. Now, privatizing the ocean, we might not privatize it in the same way as we privatize land. For example, in Iceland, they privatized fishing permits so that, so that they privatized the fishing stock, which is an original way, in a sense, to apply property rights to fishing and to the ocean. You're not going to privatize the air in the same way you privatize land. It's more, you can't put stuff into the air that I breathe that damages me. I have a lawsuit against you if you do. So it's not that hard. This is the problem. The problem is, that starting about 120 years ago, 30 years ago, late 19th century, early 20th century in America, we started looking to government for solutions for all of our problems. And we stopped innovating when it comes to private property. So for example, I'll give you an example. In the, in the, uh, in the, in, um, the Wild West in America, there was a whole body of law being built up around water rights and how to deal with water. If your cows pooped up on the, on the stream and I drank the water, how do we resolve that dispute? And all of that, there was a whole body of law built around that through common law. All of that was stopped when the government took over ownership of the land and of the rivers and of the lakes and of all this stuff. So then it all went through regulations and controls and, and top down rather than bottom up figuring out the issues of property rights. So the solution is freedom. The solution is getting the government out of the way. We, me and you, can solve the problems. I have no doubt in my mind. The problem is when politicians don't allow us to solve the problems, they interfere, they intervene with regulations and controls and definitions and tell us what we can and cannot do. So if we allow markets to function, and if we allow common law and the legal system to properly function, these problems that are associated with a filthy property can be solved, I have no doubt in my mind. And some of them will be hard to solve. And for example, one of the beauty in America of federalism, each state being different, is that one state might solve them in one way. Individuals might solve them in one way in one state. They might solve it indifferently in another state. And then... We'll figure out what works better. And we might adopt one method versus the other. All right. F thank you very much. We have one last question if you have time. Sure. I, but I have to do it quickly. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So what, what do you think about the idea that resources are limited? To me, a resource is a resource only as a consequence of somebody understanding how to use it. There is no limit on, as long as we have people thinking and the unlimited resource is the mind. So yeah, so I, I encourage everybody to read Julian Simon. Mm -hmm. He's an economist who wrote The Ultimate Resource where he explains why resources are unlimited. The only thing limited is our own imagination, right? Our own ability to, to think, to, to conceive. And the more people thinking, the, the, the less limited resources are because there's more people trying to solve problems. So no, if the resource is energy, we will always discover new forms of energy. Even if one form of energy uh, it goes, it, it is limited, energy is not limited. Energy is unlimited. We will always innovate and discover more. The same with food, the same with everything. So there is no such thing as unlimited, as limited resources. Resources are unlimited in a sense that human ability 
to think is unlimited, to innovate is unlimited, to progress is unlimited. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much My for, for, for your time. It was really a pleasure to have you. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. And hopefully next time we could do it in person. I'd love to, I'd love to be in Paris right now. Um, but this is, uh, this is second best. It's, it's yes. We hope the situation will be better by then. All right. Have a nice day. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.